I'm going to quickly give an update on this story that I spoke about, Tory, which is funny, slip of my tongue, but this story I spoke about before regarding this new London club opening called The Ton of Bricks. And I, for one, was just excited just from being a punter and from being an aspiring DJ myself that there's another place where potentially I could maybe play in the future and there's another place where I could potentially go and party my face off, sweat my face off, dance a bit, have some good times, meet some new people and enjoy the music and the vibes, right? That's the kind of only way I'm sort of looking at this sort of story. But obviously, when it comes to London, it's always multi-layered. There's always more to it than meets the eye. And this update, courtesy of RA, basically shines a light on something that I may have missed out on but also having read this and having done some research behind some things that have gone on with the club and the space over there i've got to a point where i'm just like enough enough so it's twofold but anyway let's read the story it says the opening of london club the, the ton of bricks met with controversy the new bricks and spots sits in what was formerly called club 414 an historic local venue that was forced to close in 2019 the launch of Tunnel Bricks, the South London Club for its UK promoters percolating Bricks and Jam, has been met with controversy. Set in officially open tomorrow, which is December 9th, we obviously it's passed already. The Bricks and Venue has been criticised for its ties to Taylor McWilliams, the controversial US property developer and part-time DJ whose investment firm Hondo Enterprises is considered an unwelcome, gentrifying force by much of the local community. Along with the Bricks and Village and Bright Market, bro, <laughs> he's been taking over the entire place, basically. Those are the only things that you'd go to bricks and four to be fair especially if you're a normie um, the building housing the ton of bricks is one of several SY, SW9 assets in Honda's portfolio the concerns also extend to the building's former tenant the historic club 414 which was evicted by the developer London Associated Properties LAP in May 2019 after 38 years so they had the spot for 38 years and it got evicted in 2019 three months later LAP sold the premises to McWilliams for a reported 2.35 million at the time Honda said it was committed to keep the space as a music venue the tunnel bridge project was also born in 2019 a contact of the percolates co-founders connected them with the space percolate then approached drip bricks and jam in a bid to involve the local venue owner the project which has a 24-hour license was repeatedly um, de delayed partly due to covid pandemic DJ such as okay william sophie k jay duncan as well as jumbi programmer rudy minto de weiss have is they pronounce it the, the ways or is it the age and let's just say RMDW took to Instagram stories yesterday, December 7th, to criticize Tunnel Bricks. Um, RDDW said, Percolate and Bricks and Jam need to rethink their decision to open a club in the premises owned by McWilliams, describing it as a literal erasure of culture. A little bit dramatic there, but let you say what you want. London based platform Keep Hush, which was due to host a party at the club yesterday, decided to relocate to the near spot called Loki. Why didn't you go there in the first place? But hey, let's continue. Hannah T. Dubley, co founder of Local, a club like that ran the club at 414. Um, that ran a club night, sorry, for bomb form, had mixed feelings about the situation, um, which is probably the most mature side of things to look at it is like this. I'm really happy that a club will take over the new space. It means music, it means jobs, she told RA. But at the same time, I'm really devastating that the building is owned by Taylor McWilliams and feel guilt and regret that the activism that was put on to good use with Steve Noir wasn't able to keep 414 safe. Club founders Tony and Louise were really fucking special. Percolate and Bricks and Jam now has res now responded to the concerns with a joint statement sent to RA. Um, there's a statement. They say we are we are we are well aware of the importance of Club 414, and we don't give a fuck. <laughs> it continues to many in the area and the legacy and it leaves behind. This closing was a huge loss of Bricks and Night Life scene, and we joined you in mourning what, <laughs> what the owners built. <laughs> Uh, this is such full of shit but i love it <laughs> you have to do these things just to appease people but essentially we're not going to close we're not going to change anything we're going to do what we're going to do you have to get over it but let's continue to be clear we're in no way connected to the depiction we are committed to honoring the legacy as an independent grassroots music venue and maintaining this space for nurturing local talent we're committed to supporting bricks and nightlife and providing somewhere special to dance and enjoy the fantastic diverse scene that takes back decades in the area <laughs> whitewashed brixton has been cornerstone venue of the area two decades and percolate forged this early identity in the what's that how do you say that in a simulacra Simulac simulacra simulacra studios on cold harbor lane almost a decade ago we are deeply um we care deeply about the area and want to make sure that the tunnel bricks helps history develop the space to live on all right cool we first met when we first were approached about the site in 2019 they meant just to stress that we were approached 
the damage is already done leave me alone we are told by the property agent that it was an unoccupied as a previous landlords to hondo market lane um had evicted club 414 tenants after a long process dating back to 2014 according to bricks and buzz this had previously included the turn the space into a luxury flats or a b at one market road uh limited when we started ton of bricks project it was well before the save i know campaign began in 2020 so they're saying look don't get us involved this could have been worse this could have been a flipping a tower block made out of glass and flipping you know steel with some horrible dilapidated sterile coffee shop downstairs where everybody greets you by saying what's up or something Jeremy, you know I it could be that bad when we started ton of bricks project we were well before the save i know campaign happened and tay mcwilliams hondo weren't in the spotlight as they are now we had no involvement with the hondo house outside of the fact that there are landlords that we pay rent to the same as a huge number of other independent businesses across Brixton and villages or market room beyond oh, i thought they're gonna start naming names Ooh. um we have been in touch with the key voices in Brixton community throughout the process opening the venue the input has been invaluable and we're very grateful for it <laughs> input mate um 20 that's one of the most useless kind of terms people can use for you all right input we want your input can we touch bases that's just like, you know, we're going to pay you to, you know, to share your expertise and your knowledge. No, actually, we're not going to pay you. We're going to meet you and we're going to extract all the knowledge and expertise that you know about. And then we're just going to send you on your merry way. But you're going to be happy because you got the chance to talk to us. That's a special. Anyway, it continues. At the same time, we spoke to prominent voices in, in the area, including Bricks and Buzz and members of the Save Our Noir campaign, as well as the local figures in the music scene. Um, these discussions were part of a wider effort to make sure that the venue got off to a right start and to build a reputation with high standards that we set ourselves. This proposal included supporting live music from the area, providing hospitality for the local bars, free entry after after their shifts, and stocking beers from local breweries, as well as hosting open decks for aspiring DJs and more. <laughs> this legitimately made me laugh when I said open decks because I was like, hold on, I've been to a few open decks. Does that mean an open decks night is essentially a weird kind of affirmative action thing? That's them sort of trying to address the imbalance in this industry and scene. There's not enough women. There's not enough black people playing. So let's have these open deck nights out because it's going to attract people that don't usually get to play. And they're going to be a lot of, you know, <laughs> a lot of women, a lot of black people. <laughs> they're going to come and want to play here and make their name and play in front of like 10 people on a Wednesday night. And then we basically ticked off the, you know, we ticked our, you know, our social justice obligations off that list on that day or for the week or for the month. I never looked at it that way. I never looked at open deck nights. I legitimately looked at it as like a showcase. You know, like how you go to like, um, like there's an open mic for, you know, in terms of music, you know, in terms of comedy, whatever it may be, poetry, there's like open mic events you can go to. And the idea behind that is that, if you do a good enough job at an open mic, either your performance is good or you bring on a ton of people, they may then tell you, hey, we're going to give you some dates and they're going to pay you in advance and you get a cut of the tickets, whatever. But it's a way to kind of get your career kick-started. That's why I found open decks tonight was, but essentially I was a, a kind of, um, I was a, an unwitting accomplice, you know, to this place's <laughs> attempts to rewrite the racial imbalances in the industry. Honestly, fucking incredible. But I can't blame them though, to be fair to them. They did treat me right, Bricks and Jam. I went to the open deck tonight. Somebody, I guess, liked my set enough to recommend me to play at a following party that happened maybe a couple of months after that, which was a pretty big one. Even though I played like an opening set, it was still really busy. I got a chance to play in front of a crowd. I got to meet some other people playing too. It was fun. Do you know what I mean? So I don't have nothing bad to say about those guys specifically, but I just find it hilarious that this is one of the terms they put into the thing. Like, hey, we're going to host open deck night so you blackies can come along and play as well. <laughs> anyway back in 2019 when we started the venture before COVID-19 pandemic it was estimated that 40 percent of london venues had closed in the last decade which was massively escalated to the crisis levels of the previous two years we want to launch something that bucks this trend and provide the positive force in the area after lying vacant we're excited about opening and welcome everyone to the venue basically saying fuck you we're gonna open it anyway which i understand so my thinking about all this is that I've kind of had enough with the complaining. I understand gentrification is bad. Boo hoo hoo. It really does wreck and ruin places. I've seen it with my own bloody eyes from the places that I grew up in in London, especially places like Canning Town, Custom House, Stratford, Plasto, Upton Park, Forest Gate, Leighton, Leighton Stone, Wolverhampton. So all these places have been flipping this, you know, 
flipping annihilated when it comes to gentrification and even hackney to some extent but i didn't really grow up there for the most part even though i hanged out there quite a bit so i get it i understand where the frustration is coming from but let's be honest as well i don't really see much effort or many kind of um ideas kind of being sprung from the dance music scene or the nightlife scene of people basically gathering their resources together and their collective minds to find out cool and interesting ideas that they can get around to circumnavigate things whether it means some of them maybe pitches in some money to buy the buildings in some sort of a you know cohort thing or whatever maybe where everyone puts in a bit of money each way or they you know work out a plan with the landlord to extend the lease for a long time or talk to a council there's not really any clever solutions in play everyone's kind of just going to the places that are already set up and already done doing stuff you know under the table kind of underground but i don't really see people making an effort for the most part to really go a long way to try and create the space that they want that they see doesn't really exist because essentially when you put on a club night you're essentially trying to fill a void that you don't see out there and the only way you can do it the kind of affordable way at when you first start is just to go somewhere else and kind of plug in your community plug in your sound plug in your vibe into what they're already doing but over time especially if you're somebody that kind of cares about what you're doing you'll realize that they're always going to be a sort of a ceiling that you are going to eventually hit especially in london when it comes to noise complaints when it comes to local councils when it comes to just uh you know the the temporary nature of the whole thing right because i always say these scenes only really last for four years really and then you kind of have to keep reinventing yourself to a certain extent so the only way to really do it in a sustainable way would be to own your own spot so you have different things going on at the same time so you're kind of always you know um always at the front of the trends when things are changing and not tr not desperately trying to chase them but that's the thing that's really concerning. I don't really see any difference because I've heard these complaints from years and years ago. And it seems that nothing has really changed when it comes to the council side of things. Nothing's really changed from these, you know, um, parasitical, you know, or, you know, predatory flipping, you know, um, gentrifiers coming in and taking advantage of places that are dilapidated that probably don't have people that maybe have the means to buy these places in the first place, but they've got a lot of hype and hipster energy behind them and they obviously go into it so they can obviously make a ton of money. But also the people who live there make these places cool. You guys need to make more of an effort to figure something out. I don't know what it is right now. Like I said, there could be a cohort or something. There could be some agreement with the landlord, but it has to be some solution to this and make it work because I feel like all these complaints are really a nonsense like if you look at this story in in actuality this these landlords who owned club 414 again i'm only looking at it from the outside in i'm not from brixton i know nothing about the local scene there Lo london is very territorial that way if you hang out in east you only stay in east if you hang out in north you only stay in north and visa you know and and blah 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 so i only know what i know about what i'm viewing based on the articles i read and some other bits and bobs that i've been you know privy to but from what i'm aware of this place you were there for what more than two decades in this club 414 the building eventually only in my opinion only ended up selling for 2.5 million surely in those two decades plus there could have been a solution to maybe do a fundraiser do something to have the ability to buy the building yourself so you can safeguard your future and the future of the club for years to come and then if you want to hand it over to like the new generation people to kind of do what they need to do to it then fair enough but this idea that over 20 plus years nobody had any kind of inkling or ability to buy the place i don't necessarily believe i'm sure there's going to be some things in place some laws or stipulations put into place maybe you know especially if you don't have a passport or something along those kind of lines or you don't have permanent residency stay in the uk that might affect your ability to buy places but i feel like there isn't enough ingenuity behind figuring out how to make these places work and how to basically maybe work in conjunction with the local community or just figure out a way to set up your own space there's loads of complaining and pointing at a boogeyman that is flipping you know um gentrifiers and property developers and stuff which is easy to do because it's clear what they're doing is abhorrent and taking advantage again of really horrible you know areas and the dilapidation in them and the lack of care that's gone into them and whatnot and maybe the you know the, the poverty that surrounds it but surely there must be a solution to this surely there must be because we can't just keep complaining about gentrification all day long whilst there's clearly a 
real need for these spaces and these clubs to exist because people still clamor to them the opening night or i think the big night i think maybe it was saturday or something completely sold out i know that might be deceptive because they may have put on you a certain amount of tickets on there whatever you want to say but still clearly there's an appetite for it or somebody like a Brixton and jam wouldn't bother even getting involved because they've already got a pretty good situation going for them where Brixton and jam i'm sure percolate probably don't need the extra hassle also so they definitely saw that there was a gap in the market that they could take advantage of that could maybe service a particular crowd of people People who maybe haven't been servicing that part of South London and they're opening it so it's not like these spaces are going to waste people are going to fill them if that's the case why don't we from the community do it ourselves sort of always waiting until the last minute and then by that time it's too late and developers when they come in as abhorrent as it is it's their money they can do what the hell they want with it they want to turn turn it into the headquarters for flipping cost of coffee they can do so it's disgusting and it takes away from everything that we love especially myself being on you know being somebody that was out in Dawson for a while and then seeing how it's changed and you know you've got a fucking brew dog on that fucking street for bloody you know as a good example but i feel like over time there just needs to come a point where people just say enough is enough and just start making or setting up their own clubs or buying their own spaces or making sure they can secure the long-term future of the spaces they are using by maybe asking some questions from behind the scenes about what's going on how they can get involved that way because it's all well and good setting up flyers all well and good designing the flyers putting lineups together playing somewhere but if these spaces we don't own there's no way we can go forward especially considering that we have little to no help from the government for the most part right what, what the fuck is amy lammy where is she in this situation every time something like this happens you call her name and you're screaming and she's nowhere to be found she has one of the bestest and easiest jobs i've ever seen in my entire life when it comes to a government official she's meant to look after nightlife she's meant to be an advocate for clubs and you know people that love to go out you know in the night in general and she's nowhere to be seen at night in the day nowhere to be seen but collecting a government check nonetheless those are people that should be helping but they don't so if that's the case i like to always live in the world as it is as opposed to be trying to imagine a utopia where all things being equal no things are equal no things are fair we have to get into the mud with these property developers and put in bids and orders for them because if they were able to buy that venue i think it says here 2.5 million right if i'm not mistaken they purchased it for 2.5 million i don't know 2.35 million sorry i don't think these people who were at the place already 38 years so more than two decades right more than three decades nearly four decades they were there and they didn't have the ability to put together 2.35 million whether or not it was from their own funds whether or not it's from fundraising whether or not it's from a patreon um or something right or some or someone basically maybe just loved the place and wanted to help out donation whether maybe there could have been something done beforehand to before we got to this place um but you know we are where we are now at the moment i guess they're trying to meet the community in the middle by you know having these having these affirmative action open decks and stuff but you know i don't know man i just feel like there's too much complaining going on now i don't think you can blame bricks and jam i don't think you can blame percolate for trying to fill a gap fill a void and provide london with much needed club space because we don't have enough to be honest that's what i've always said i feel like every area in london needs to have at least one if not two folds where you've got a place where you can go and party until 6 a.m every single weekend needs to exist because i feel like that'll take a lot of stress away from the you know local services police ambulances whatever they may be and also it'll put money back into the community where people are going out all day long they can get a breakfast in the morning at the local cafe they can maybe go to the office i mean you know post office on the way home so maybe get another drink for the afters whatever it may be do like i've seen the differences done to the area that i grew up in in canning town and it's kind of reinvigorated the whole place because now there's a you know a constant stream of people going there to hang out to go to the party to leave to go home again so all the local shops have basically seen a boom and an uptick in the amount of people going in there on a daily basis but you need at least one of those places in each part of london each part and the fact that there's one already exists now that they're doing and they're trying to set up and some more coming is a good thing obviously it's been done in some you know there's some skullduggery involved as per usual when it comes to the housing market but i feel like there should be no more time for complaining and whining about these sort of things we need to take some action at the very least to protect the things that we love and it seems that people are not doing it so far but hopefully this will be the change that we need to see going forward so less complaining more doing and hopefully we can be the change that we need to see